Hey, everyone. Before we get into today's interview, just wanted to drop a little reminder to stay up to date with all the latest episodes of On The Margin. You can subscribe to the BlockWorks Back Row YouTube. Just go up there, just click the little uh, subscribe button, or you can click the links at the top of this episode. It'll take you over to Apple, Spotify, whatever your preferred platform is. Just subscribe there. If you could, leave a rating and review. Really appreciate it. All right, on with the show. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of On The Margin. Today, I'm joined by repeat guest Julian Brigden, uh, co-founder at MI2 Partners. Julian. Welcome back to the program. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, thanks. So we're actually recording this the day before Thanksgiving. So what do you say we scrap all of this macro talk and you just give me that turkey recipe that you were talking about before? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Indeed. <laughs> yeah, that's what the people want. Um, yeah. Yeah, but you and I uh, are going to be together in London soon, actually. So uh, looking very much looking forward to that. Uh, March 18th, not too long, not too long. And um, if folks like uh, this talk and what you and I are chatting about now, that's going to be a nice presage, I think. Uh, and maybe we can check ourselves to see how accurate we are uh, when we're together in person in uh, in March of this. I'm putting you on the spot. It's the dangerous bit, Michael. Yeah, no, <laughs> sure, absolutely. Um, Okay, so just to just to dive right in here, you and I were were chatting a little bit before the program about um, still the the sort of maybe disparage uh, the disparity in between what the market thinks in terms of inflation and what even one or three year inflation expectations are saying. So you just start at sort of the highest level and give us your thoughts on inflation. Uh, sort of what periods in history are you looking at as sort of a guide or or analogies and just kind of your your high level thoughts on the macro, right? So. Now. Look, I think if you take a very sort of big picture view, uh, um, inflation's a bit like a uh, you know throwing a uh, a stone into a pond. You typically get ripples. So sometimes the ripples, bizarrely, can be bigger than the first one. Sometimes they're smaller, but you typically get ripples. And I think you know a couple of stories have sort of piqued my attention a little bit. Um, you know the that corporate profitability now is being mostly driven by price increases, right? So, you know, once you get that mentality, and there was something I think it was uh, one of the Fed governors was at a, uh, I think it was Hawker maybe, was at a, uh, a Q&A locally, and he asked a bunch of local execs, you know, how many of you putting your prices up by 5% or more next year? And two thirds of the audience put their hand up and he was like, whoa, 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 you know, I'm trying to fight inflation. Don't do this. But I think, I think the point is, is once that, you know, we've gone through a period of 30 odd years where it was really persona non grata to think about raising prices, mm. right? You just, didn't have that. So you had to drive everything through productivity. You had to, you know, your pricing power, you were very scare careful about flexing that muscle because, you know, even if you may have it, you were worried about being displaced by some new technology or something. So forth. That's gone, right? You can see it now in a lot of these corporate earnings, you know, certainly in the staple side of the equation, you know, Johnson & Johnson's and Pepsi's, they've done it for quarter after quarter after quarter, right? They have raised revenue by raising prices even more, even if volume is down. They don't give a shit about volume. They just want to raise that revenue. And so I think, you know, that's sort of one concern that I've got. The second one, I think that a lot of, when I look at the inflation picture, uh, and by the way, I see corporate pricing rising again. So that supports, as we move into early next year, all my corporate pricing models are picking up. And they've been very, very good, Michael. It's one of the reasons why we managed to catch the inflation story in 2021 um, and and get out of it, you know, to be honest, uh, this, uh, this last year um, was because we caught that corporate pricing increase. And those models are now re-accelerating. And quite markedly, they sort of suggest a CPI um, picking up from sort of 3.2 towards 5 um, in the first quarter into the second quarter of next year. Um, the second thing is actually you can see that if you look at, say, um, Michigan inflation expectations, those numbers just, everyone dismisses them. You know, what does the consumer know? But in actual fact, he's not bad, right? You know, he's not bad. He's pretty damn good at catching turns. And in fact, you know, if anyone wants to sit and do a bit of chart porn for themselves, they can take the... Michigan one-year inflation expectations, put it against CPI, run the chart from 2008. The overlay is very, very tight. And the fact that he's, and he, he caught the turn early three times in that period. 
And now he's suggesting a, once again, a massive reacceleration in inflation. And I think, and Julian, not to, not to interrupt you there, but it, maybe the reason that that's so tight is because there's inherently an, a self, self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Where if the consumer believes that there's going to be inflation, that it's much more likely than that there is inflation, right? There's an embedded sort of psychological component. Correct. I mean, this is, this is a, you know, you, 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 get us onto another topic about the credibility of the policy that the Fed is currently pursuing at the moment. But this is only the second time they've ever pursued it. Um, The mid-90s was the other time it worked in the mid-90s. But the the big concern back then when they pursued this was because it takes a long time to work its way through the system, this particular one, this particular approach is called opportunistic disinflation as opposed to deliberate disinflation, which is the policy that Volcker kind of pursued. It's a, it's a softer trade-off, Michael, where you don't shove the terminal rate to the point that it kills the patient. You shove it to the point that, that it's uncomfortable, but as yeah. a result, you have to leave it there for a very, very long time. And the problem with that very, very long time is you actually risk that because it takes so long, inflation expectations become unhinged. And to your point exactly, once you build that psychology into the system, which is what happened in the late 60s into the 70s, your only solution is a Volcker. And that would be catastrophic uh, for the world and catastrophic for this country. Um, So, you know, they're trying to play this game, but it's, it's not clear to me that it's working. I certainly think inflation pressures are picking up. I think in many areas, inflation uh, actually hasn't really dropped out of the system. So if you look at, you know, one of Powell's favorites, so you look at uh, service inflation, including shelter, but X energy, it's still sitting at over 5%. I think the number's 5.3 off the top of my head. Now, the one that's service inflation, X shelter, including energy has imploded because we've had this big base effect from energy, but typically you tend to meet, once those two diverge sufficiently, they come back and meet each other in the middle. So where does that leave us? 4%, four and a half. That's way too high. And the other problem is, is that wages tend to dictate um, where that service, that core service inflation goes. And my models are certainly suggesting that wages are starting to plateau around five. They come off, you know, from the absolute highs, but they're now starting to plateau around five. And that just is not good enough, Michael. So when I look at the world and what is priced in, this incredibly Goldilocks scenario where not only does inflation is inflation vanquished, but it's vanquished in a way so quickly that the Fed is actually able to cut rates, right? They don't have to keep them on hold at slightly restrictive. No, they can really hammer them. And yet, and then growth can reaccelerate, earnings can reaccelerate, and we can do all that while keeping unemployment low. Right, the fact that we're at three point nine is incredibly low. Now, there's only one way that happens. Right, the absolute hail mary single element that creates that perfect, perfect scenario, and that's if we get a burst of productivity. And it's possible. It's possible. But and I think AI is very important. But is it this year? Is it the next six months or is it three years from now? Because if it's three years from now, it's too fucking late. Hey everyone, it is getting to be that time of year again. We are four months out from DAS London, the largest, oldest institutional conference in crypto. Mark and I have been talking about it for the last couple of weeks. We're both going to be there hanging. Maybe you come to go on a bus tour with us, something like that. But in the meantime, I also know that it's Thanksgiving and it's Black Friday. And well, the good folks at BlockWorks Marketing have intuited that exact need and we whipped up a little Black Rock Friday promo for you. See what we did there? Yeah, because the institutions are coming. So anyway, if you head over right now to the Das London page, and if you go check out the group ticket section, you will, for the next five days, get a 20% off if you use code Black Rock Margin. That's code Black Rock Margin on the four pack of ticket group section. So grab folks from your family, grab folks from your company, 
Hop on a plane and I will see you in London on March 18th to the 20th largest institutional conference in all of crypto. And again, that is code BlackRock Margin. See you there. Yes. Okay. You're you're hitting on so much. Actually, the, I want to focus on this infl- inflation expectations and actually talk about what happened in that late 1960s, early 70s episode. So actually on the, the very last episode of the show that we did, we actually talked about one in three year inflation expectations versus what the market is pricing in. And there seems like there's a huge discrepancy. And actually, if you listen to, there's a great, I don't know if you caught the interview with uh, Stan Druckenmiller and Paul Tudor Jones recently mm-hmm. at the Robin, but he, you know, he had this line where he was sort of giving his, uh, you know, his uh, range of expectations around what inflation could be. And the thing that grabbed headlines was, you know, in a worst case, we should be prepared for eight or 9% inflation. And one goes, huh. you know, but his base case, I actually thought was much more interesting, which was three or 4%. Right. And that's what, and his three or 4% is lining up with what consumer, you know, one year, three year sort of inflations around expectation are. So on the one hand, I, I feel like there's a, a loose consensus out there forming in the market that we're probably not getting back to 2%. We're getting closer to 3%. But at the same time, the market is pricing in rate cuts on, on the short end of the curve. And it just seems like something has to give there from my perspective. That isn't like- Yeah, up. no, look, I think- <sighs> The only way that that's possible, I would guess, is, as I said, that that's sustainable, that you, that you get your rate cuts and you get 3%, you know, in an environment of 3% inflation is obviously you're looking for a Fed pivot, right? You're looking for a very, you, and it's more than a pivot. It's breaking the mold, right? It's, it isn't a pivot because a pivot would be, you know, inflation's at one and a half. And so we can pivot. You are talking for them to, Make a decision that is so significant that it is akin to the Roman general crossing the Rubicon, right? Something that was forbidden by death to bring his his legion over the Rubicon, right? Because that's a direct challenge to the emperor. Mm. If the Fed delivers what is currently priced with three to four percent inflation, they have taken the decision that for whatever reason, whether it's out of choice or they're forced into that because let's say instability elsewhere or problems elsewhere, uh, to accommodate that high inflation. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible. I suspect that's ultimately where we could end up, Michael. Mm. But it is such a significant decision for the Fed to make that my personal view is that doesn't happen without a great deal of soul searching from these guys and an inordinate degree of pain in the economy somewhere. So this idea that we just blindly slide into, oh, we're not at two, we're at three, and we're fine with that, I think is a big, I think is a big problem. And, you know, if they are to do it, then fine. But it has, it would have significant consequences for, you know, when you look at, say, break-even yields, like five year, five year break-evens at a price that's sort of 225. If you're going to three, they shouldn't be 225, right? Um it would almost certainly have, I think, huge consequences for the dollar. How so? They're not good ones, right? Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a really, this sort of, oh, we just slide into the next major pivot. Doesn't matter if inflation's only three and unemployment's under four, right? They're just going to do it because they're a bunch of bloody weaklings I don't agree with. I mean, could they do it ultimately? Yes, I suspect they will, but they won't make that decision lightly. I mean, Powell has made that point time and time again. The reason we've been in this fortunate situation since, you know, essentially Volcker crushed inflation, that whenever the economy slides into recession, we were able to ease and support growth is because we, we had that controlled inflation. We had that credibility. Right. 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 And c- could you give us uh, the analogy? Because this is something that we've talked about on the program before as well. But, you know, when you look at most periods of, I mean, the, the two real big periods of inflation that people point to in recent history within the U.S., 
the you know 70s, early 80s, and the, the 1940s, mm-hmm. both were marked by periods of stop start. And you and yes. I were just talking a little bit on, on uh, before we got on air here about the late 60s and how that was a time where the Fed was trying to engineer a soft landing, failed pretty miserably, and inflation ended up taking off. Can, can you just walk us back uh, through that that timeline, what happened then, and how that so, may or may not be relevant to this period? You know, no, I think it, look, it, it, you know, it's it's only a rhyme. It, it's never, a, you know, a, a clear pathway. Um but the analogies are kind of similar. So in the early 60s, we had this kind of Halcyon period where inflation was insanely low and insanely stable. Now, back then, we weren't worried about deflation because we weren't carrying the same degree of debt that we are now. We weren't concerned about that uh, consequence. And inflation structurally had been much higher, much longer, so we weren't in that kind of same framework. So the Fed is kind of running this relatively stable policy. Inflation is literally a flat line. And then kind of in 1965, they're starting to play around with, could we let things run a little bit hotter, you know, and we get the initial waves of the guns and butter Johnson's Great Society, right, and the Vietnam War. So the first is is the move to the launch of um uh, medical support, you know, Medicaid and, and stuff in, in 65. And it, inflation breaks out. Okay. Breaks out of that perfect little mm. rectangular range. The Fed come in and they're like, right, bam. And they hit it. And the problem is, is that you end up with a banking crisis and, uh, this very sharp slowdown, uh, in, in the banking sector, which was caused by a number of regulatory issues, which caused banks funding to sort of dry up. They were the main provider of activity in the housing market. The housing market stops on a dime. And even though unemployment doesn't rise, the Fed gets really spooked and they kind of ease, they give back some of the rate hikes. And the problem that happens is they end up easing into ongoing high levels of fiscal spending courtesy of Vietnam, okay? So, and then inflation just picks up again and we're off into wave two of what ultimately becomes, I think off the top of my head, a four-wave cycle, which ends up with in in the late 70s. So what's the analogy? Well, I think the first one, and I think it really started in 2016, was when Trump decided to, to cut taxes uh, in a pro-cyclical way that was utterly unnecessary because the economy wasn't doing badly and politicians rediscovered the power of the fiscal purse, right? Ooh, how do I get me mm. shit loads of money? I can spend it. It's really good, right? Because this had been kind of not allowed, right? You're not allowed. We have to be sensible, right? You remember... You might not remember this, but there were conversations in the Clinton era when Greenspan was there that the national debt was being paid off so quickly that we need to create a synthetic treasury curve to give a price for a synthetic risk asset that wasn't going to exist anymore because we weren't going to be issuing any debt, right? It's not that long ago, right? It just it was no debt. There was really no debt. Guess what? They've rediscovered it, right? Now, so then you fast forward to COVID and and. And and what Wait, Biden sorry, did. I'm sorry, that's a fascinating conversation. So the concern was the US is gonna fix balance the budget. We're not gonna need to issue debt and there's gonna be no risk free rate. That was the concern. Correct. Correct. <laughs> that's awesome. I didn't know. And that. it wasn't sorry. that long ago, right? It was twenty odd years ago, right? That's the that's the amazing thing. Right? That's great. That's so great. anyway, so now they've you know, Biden comes in, we get COVID. And he never let a crisis go to waste, right? Which is every politician's, you know, uh, mantra. And what do they do? They shove a ton of money into the economy, but they also shove even more to try and fulfill these social obligations, which are part of the, the Biden uh, object, uh, agenda. And as a result, this deficit has ballooned. Um, even more so, we now find that we're right fighting arguably three wars, not just a Vietnam war, but we have a Kinetic war with uh, Russia, arguably now with Hamas as well. We have a cold war with China, which is tremendously expensive. And we're fighting a 
climate change war, which is going to be extraordinarily expensive, right? You live in in um, in New York. Uh, I was just reading this article a couple of weeks ago about the Hudson Line that runs up, you know, the edge of the coast there up into Connecticut, keeps getting washed away. They're talking about raising the thing on stilts because of climate change. How many hundreds of millions of dollars is that going to cost? And that's one bloody project, right? So this is just an enormous degree of spending. Fiscal is not under control. There is no one sensible, uh, at, at, you know, in control of the wheel. So it's not hard to envisage that even if the Fed doesn't eat, right? Even if we don't get that 66, 67 kind of crisis where they make the error of, of easing, the fact that they are still taking, trying desperately to land the triple sulco with the tuck, right? So they land right on their pointy, pointy toes, right? On, on the mat and, and, and nail that soft landing, I think is a danger because I don't think they've done enough yet to guarantee the downturn, right? And to guarantee that drop in aggregate demand, which, which Powell just, you know, 10 days ago said, going forward, more of the work may have to be done by slowing aggregate demand. And yet the market just doesn't want to listen to that, right? They just, right? And slowing aggregate demand, by the way, folks, means lower GDP and lower employment, right? All right, folks, hopefully everyone is enjoying the episode with Julian. Just a quick break to remind you about something that we talked about at the top of this episode. Both Julian and I are going to be together in person for DAS London, the largest institutionally focused conference in all of digital assets. That's, there are going to be 1,200 of the largest asset managers, you know, hedge funds, uh, financial institutions, professional traders, all of that sort of things gathered on March 18th to the 20th in London this year. There are going to be some other uh, on the margin favorites, Joseph Wang, Michael Howell, et cetera. We're going to be talking about the intersection of macro and digital assets. We've also got some of the big banks, uh, Goldman, JP Morgan, BlackRock, et cetera, that were signed on to speak. It's going to be a ton of fun. So hope to see you all there in sunny London town. And honestly, guys, if nothing else, it's just a great excuse to take a vacation. And Margin 20 is going to get you 20% off discount there. So because you're such a great listener, again, Margin 20, 20% off the ticket. Hope to see you there soon. Cheers. So the other thing that Powell has talked about, maybe this is where we can get into a little bit of the more of the relationship between monetary and fiscal today. You know, Powell has been talking quite a bit about financial conditions. And specifically in the last couple of pressers, he's referred to higher rates on the long end of the curve as tightening financial conditions. Now, Correct. there's been an enormous amount of focus on the supply dynamics in the bond market, uh, recent quarterly refunding announcements. And I think Yellen, uh, you know, uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, she surprised a lot of folks by mixing uh, or, or juking the, the historic relationship in between bills and bonds, uh, right? The Treasury's issued uh, more to the, the, the side of uh, having a higher ratio of bills. Now that, it's basically been a one-way street down in terms of yields. The bond market, especially on the long end of the curve, is catching a bid for the first time in a while. But that's kind of working against Jerome Powell and what he's doing. So what are your thoughts on financial conditions now? Are they tight enough? Are they helping? No, they're they not tight, tight enough. I mean, I think before, when we had yields at about 5% and where equities were at the moment, um, I think, uh, or were at the time, I think financial conditions were probably about right. They were commensurate. It depends on, look, it depends which index you take, right? Because there's a bunch of them out there. Um, you know, Chicago Fed's got one. Goldman's got one. Bloomberg's got one. There are a bunch of them out there. But the one I personally like to use is Goldman. It seems to be one of the better ones at correlation to GDP. And uh, it was commensurate before this move with GDP of about 0.7. Right now, that's quite low, but it's not so low. It's certainly not recessionary, and that's year on year. And the other thing to bear in mind is Powell's told us, and maybe he's changing his view a little bit, but certainly last spring he told us the trend was 1.75 real, right? And so you know, 0.7, 1%, that's kind of right. Where it, financial conditions are right now, 
they're commensurate with above trend growth again, around two, two and a quarter. Now that's down from last on the year on year basis. That's down from the last quarter. But when I look at some of my models, Michael, I look at my ISM models. They suggest that, in fact, we may be working our way through the manufacturing inventory slowdown period and, and, and actually demand may be picking up again. Um, now remember it was, it was manufacturing that was supposed to and typically does lead us into the recession and it didn't this time. So if manufacturing is picking up, which is one of the most cyclical sectors of the economy, that suggests a reacceleration in GDP growth. My labor models are very sticky, as I said. Um, in fact, if you look at things like challenger layoff announcements, which are pretty good, um, they were rising very, very sharply last year. In fact, that was kind of the first indication, along with some of the ISM models, that we were heading towards potentially a recessionary landing in the first quarter. And then they have just utterly reversed. And now they're back in expansion territory again. So that's what happened in the late 60s, right? Unemployment flatlined for a bit. Yeah. You know, they were tightening it and it lost its momentum. And that's kind of dangerous, right? Because once unemployment loses its momentum, if it goes too far, it just keeps rising, right? It is truly a momentum indicator. You can run a moving average over unemployment, right? That's the definition of a momentum trade. But in the late 60s, it kind of goes up a little bit and then it drops again. So it never quite rises enough to get the momentum ball, the ball rolling, rolls over again, your wages come through again, and off your inflation goes again. And it just looks to me that of all, of three major economies, which I follow pretty closely, the UK, Europe, and the US, the US has arguably got the easiest monetary policy still, right, of all three. Really? Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, as the easiest monetary policy of all three. And um, yet we're the ones thinking inflation is defeated. And, you know, the Fed, and we've actually got more price, price cuts priced into the front end of our curve than either Europe or the UK. So it's just going to be Nirvana, Goldilocks. Yo, baby. Well, maybe it's really this. Right, off we go again, right? And it's just going to be great. And I, as I said, maybe if we get the productivity burst, but I think it's not coming yet, or if the Fed says, okay, we don't care about 2% inflation. It's not what they're telling us at the moment. But we're going to go to three. But if they do that, there will be consequences and they won't be nice ones. So, I, you know, I just think as things set up at the moment, this is a, the narrative at the moment against this price action. I think it's just, it's just, is wrong. Is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I've been sort of waiting for here? The, the, the sequence of events that I had in my head was, you know, first there's some sort of change in monetary accommodation from the Fed. Then that has an impact on interest rates that flows through to housing that flows through to corporations and, and earnings. And then that finally flows through into uh, unemployment. And right. it almost feels like we got some of the way through that, but then we've just stopped. And some of the things that needed, so first of all, despite the you know 30-year mortgage rate going from sub 3% to kissing 8%, you know, house, housing prices have remained relatively stable. Um, you know, earnings are still relatively strong. I think we're pricing in quite a bit for the coming years, but they've held up, they've held up pretty well. Um, and, and unsurprisingly, right, when the wealth effect is still kicking into high gear, right, people aren't losing money in the form of their houses, corporations are still earning money. Yeah, of course, of course, people are still, uh, why would, why would these corporations let go of anyone? So it, it sort of feels like we got about halfway through the normal economic cycle and then we just kind of stopped. And maybe that's kind of saying the same thing as, as your indicators picking back up. Yeah. And I think, look, I, you know, it would be lovely to think the Fed can land the triple salt coal with the tuck. And they do it a little bit more often than people give them credit for. But as I said, they've never done it from this level of unemployment before successfully. They tried it in the 60s. It was a total frigging train wreck it, within a couple of years, right? You know, inflation had ripped again. So I think, um, 
you know, be careful what you wish for. And I do think, you know, this is a, this is a tough one because the Fed is desperately trying to pursue this new, not new, because Greenspan did it in the mid nineties, this sort of more, less aggressive policy. But that requires higher for longer. And higher for longer is not what the markets are pricing. The markets are pricing the classic rates go up. They immediately come down again. Well, they immediately come down again because at that point you've had the recession, your equity markets got dinged, but now we've got, they were meet, they're going up, but we're going to be expanding and the equity market is going to be going up and they're still going to be cutting. And that doesn't make any sense. So when I think, you know, one of the trades that I've talked about with a lot of my clients is this, this mispricing at the front end of the US curve, that this idea that we're going to get 60 basis points plus of rate cuts next year, 70 basis, just doesn't make any sense to me unless you get that recession because we haven't tightened things enough to kill this economy. Yeah. Okay. I want to, I want to ask you a couple of questions, um, about earnings and, and just the stock market in general before we get into, I, I want to sort of end our conversation talking about this idea of fiscal dominance and the role of yeah. increasing role of the treasury. But here's my question for you. I'm just even thinking through this, this kind of live here, which is always a dangerous thing to do. But if the market is, if the market is baking in expectations of rate cuts, but that is not commensurate with where the market thinks, uh, you know, inflation is going and what the Fed is ultimately going to have to do, isn't the current equity market valuation or wherever the S&P or the NASDAQ is, isn't that a function of where the market thinks rate cuts are coming in? And if those rate cuts don't end up happening, does the market have to adjust lower to compensate for that? Well, you would, you would think so. And certainly certain sectors of the, of the equity market have adjusted lower. Um, but yeah, in theory, look, I, I say in theory, uh, because I think the equity market to a large degree has a lot to do with liquidity as opposed to rates. The kind of correlation actually to rates started to break down, particularly in the sort of 2003 and then really accelerated in 2008, 2009, to the point that the correlation flipped. So as rates, as bond yields rose, equities rose. And I think that was because in large part, the Fed was doing QE. QE is reflationary. Bond yields tend to rise under QE and equities tend to rise under QE. Um, and so, uh, they, they just haven't really cared about rates. And I think in part, as I said, that's co correlation flip. I think the second issue is that people have got very, very used to a Fed that continuously comes to the rescue, continuously comes to the rescue. They've got very used to very high levels of returns, Michael. You know, so everyone says, well, oh, you know, now you can get 5%, right, in the money market fund, right? But didn't, aren't we told that you get 10 to 15% in equity? So five, fuck that, right? Why would I, why would I bother? Right? Why would I bother? I'll just, you know, so where do rates have to go to entice investors to, to take their money out of, of equity? Maybe a lot higher. So look, I would think that it should have an impact, right? It should certainly take the edge off this euphoria and at some point as it manifests itself into the real world right higher rates manifest themselves into slowing consumption you would expect earnings to fall and all other things being equal stocks to move lower but i worry that the big impact is the wealth effect and yeah. that wealth effect is a function of the level of the index is driven by liquidity, not so much rates. So rates may have to go a lot higher or the Fed may have to get more serious with liquidity. And on that issue, Michael, I worry really about what Janet is going to do with that little pool of cash she has sitting in the TGA. I mean, a conversation that a lot of myself, my, I've had with a lot of clients. Is, isn't it just too tempting to take that Treasury General account and run it down into the middle of the year to try and provide essentially 
unfunded, so in other words, they haven't had to take the money out of the markets, government spending. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for listening to On The Margin. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about a very special offer that we have coming out of BlockWorks Research. Now, many of you will probably be familiar with our platform, but BlockWorks Research is the most blue chip spot to get research, data, governance, models, and a whole lot more about the leading DeFi protocols in the space. I've leaned on our analysts time and time again to explain complicated concepts going on in DeFi to me like I'm five years old. They can do the same for you. If you invest in DeFi or are just interested in it, it is an absolute no-brainer. As a listener of On The Margin, and to say thank you all for listening to the show, you can use Margin 10 for a 10% discount, and that gives you access to everything, which would be weekly in-depth reports, live data, all of that good stuff. So again, that's code MARGIN10 for a 10% discount. Link is in the show notes. Sign up now. Thank you later. So, so you're a lot of what you're describing here, by the way, we had Michael Howell on the program recently as well, who also be with us in London, but he was describing the liquidity picture. And that's actually been picking up uh, quite a bit, even over the last uh, 12 months or so. And in addition to the TGA, the other little pool um, that that uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen has is the rever- the funds in the reverse repo facility. So one of the other aspects of this uh, this decision to issue bills is it seems like that's specifically being targeted at money market funds that have uh, funds parked in the reverse repo. So that's basically like consider it there was at, at peak kind of two or two and a half trillion dollars worth of liquidity kind of moved into this black hole, and now at the same time that rate hikes are happening, you know it's they're kind of being in te- liquidity is being enticed out back into the system by the decision to issue right. those bills. And I think, look, it just leaves me, don't get me wrong, I mean, I look at the setup in equities and I think we've gone from the Magnificent Seven to arguably the Magnificent Two, right? It's really it's really Microsoft and NVIDIA that are sort of pushing to new highs now. Um, the others aren't, right? The others look, you know, Netflix looks questionable, uh, Google looks questionable, even Apple's not as massively underperformed the other fangs. Right. I mean, it, it, it's really getting a narrow breadth. And I think people must remember if you've never seen the movie, right? At the end of the movie, there's only three left of the magnificent seven, right? The other four are dead. But, you know, when I do look at the equity market, it does look stretched, you know, so I'm not disputing the possibility. And I spoke, you know, I had a, a conversation we did for, for Real Vision. Um, with Barry Knapp, who's a good friend of mine and, and, you know, very good equity guy. And he thinks early next year, we get some pressure on the equity market. So I'm, and I do too, and I'm not disputing that, but if they deploy those other pools of liquidity, Michael, then essentially you're going to have a situation where treasury and the fed are going in opposite directions, right? Where the treasury is undermining the fed's ability to slow the economy. And in that situation, I'm afraid, what's going to take it in the teeth is the bloody bond market. And that has been the MO since the Fed started to raise rates. The only element of financial conditions that has really done all the heavy lifting, because credit has not, credit spreads have not blown out that much. The dollar has not really risen that much. It's risen a bit, then come off and risen, you know, it's up a bit, but not that much. Stocks have not contributed at all to the tightening of financial conditions. Two-year yields and 10-year yields have had to do all the tightening, right? And so if equities don't come off next year, because Treasury plays silly buggers with liquidity, trying to keep this game going into the election, then bonds are going to have to do it. And ooh, that could get nasty. Yeah. And you know what? Even here, I've, I don't have all the Magnificent Seven on this chart, but I was just, I was just looking at, that's a really good call out, by the way, that NVIDIA and Microsoft are doing all the heavy lifting now when it comes to the Magnificent Seven. Oh, wait on a second. Um, and, uh, it's really NVIDIA is what's, what's keeping wow. the market up. And, and the, the combination, you know, what does Microsoft and NVIDIA have that the other, uh, you know, parts of the Magnificent Seven don't? They have an AI narrative. That's bolstering them, right? So NVIDIA is the one that's really kicked off uh, or it's been the poster child and the, the preferred way to get exposure, uh, public market exposure to, to AI. But if you take that chart back another year, if you take it back, you know, over two years, maybe, you'll see just this, the extent to which these guys are breaking to new highs because it's really only Microsoft and NVIDIA that have moved. I mean, Apple is not at new highs, Right. 
it's still not at new highs. Um, NVIDIA is obviously at new highs. Netflix nowhere close to new highs. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. In fact, when I look at them, Michael, they look to me like, and indeed the whole NASDAQ composite looks like a classic bowl where we're fully, where, where we're actually filling the bull trap. Right. And the classic bubble, you know, is not, I mean, your video isn't, but the other ones do look like that. So look, don't get me wrong. I, I've written about this, you know, the, there are definitive vulnerabilities in the U.S. equity market. The breadth is getting insanely narrow. But if it doesn't back off and it doesn't start to contribute to the tightening of financial conditions, which I believe is necessary, then you can't get bullish on bonds because they're going to go again. Yeah. I actually have a, you know, it's that that classic bull trap that you're describing. Uh, a couple months ago, I'd pull up these two charts, one next to another, but one, and this maybe is a space that you don't follow quite as, as closely, but if you look at something like, like Bitcoin, it had this very classic, uh, you know, sort of peak in 21. Uh, then it looked like it, it sold off. Then it looked like it just broke out ahead of its new high. And then, you know, kablooey and the whole thing imploded in FTX and all those other disasters. Yeah. And that looks a hell of a lot like if you looked at exactly the chart that you were saying, the NASDAQ, it was like this, this crazy run up, you know, sell off. It looks like could have been a, a ripper bear market rally or it could be like the party is still going. And it's just, it's right about where it, where it was at its peak. And so now I feel like it's sort of a moment of truth that do we keep going here or do we just, uh, or is this a bubble? Do we sell off? That's, you know, if I, I think I can share my, Screen. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the one that just screen, just screen, entire screen. Okay. So I think you should be able to see that NASDAQ chart, right? Yep. So this is kind of a oh, classic beautiful. bull track, uh, bubble kind of scenario where you get this kind of period of discovery. I mean, it, you know, the NASDAQ's been long around long enough that that probably doesn't really apply. But this kind of, you get a bear trap after you get, you sort of double price, it drops off, it comes back down somewhere to meet that sort of long-term line. Maybe you can draw it, you know, a little bit higher. But then you get this liquidity-induced parabolic upload, right? And you create, the narrative is self-fulfilling because it, it, it fits the price. And then when the liquidity peaks, you get, the sell-off because it just isn't the same amount of cash there anymore, Michael. And we're coming back again to test these kind of neckline levels. And these are kind of important. Now, if you get above here, fine, this thing can melt up again. But it's an interesting point. But if you do get up here, then bonds are going to melt down again, right? Prices, bond yields have got to go back up again to slow this economy down, right? Because it just isn't slowing. And by the way, if you want to look at a period that was similar, I mean, in some respects, a, a chart that was very, very similar, it was the NASDAQ bubble um, back in 2000. Bear trap, parabolic move, funded by liquidity. Now, the big difference is all the money went away here, right, when these facilities expired from Y2K, and clearly that's not the case. But look, you had that double tap again, right, against that, that neckline. So, you know, I'm not saying it's completely, in, you know, analogous, but it's, I think it gets, this is an interesting juncture. And I think as I wrote one of my pieces, this is a tug of war going on here, right? You can't ease broad financial conditions. If you can't ease broad financial conditions, then actually fact, given, and this is, I think what people, maybe this will come as a bit of a revelation to some of your listeners, given that Broad financial conditions are definitionally a currency element, a bond element, twos and tens, a credit element, and an equity element. That actually is very, very similar to a balanced portfolio, right? And that's the classic kind of balanced portfolio, yes. right? 60, 40 bonds, you know, change the mix a bit, get a bit credit, you know, whatever, right? So if financial conditions can't ease, 
That actually means you can't make money in your balanced portfolio. Right? If the Fed has to hold financial conditions for the next two years or a year or whatever it is here, you can't make money in your balanced portfolio. And what that actually means, Michael, in concrete terms, is if you make money in your equity portfolio or the equity sleeve, you must lose money in the bond sleeve or the credit sleeve or the overseas stock sleeve, which means dollar, right? Mm. That's how the mechanics work. And I, you know, so right here, right now, if equities continue to go, if, as I said, interesting levels, interesting chart patterns, but if they do keep going, then bonds, this rally that we've got in bonds, this fall in yields, fade it because it ain't sustainable. Mm. So maybe to return that, I, you know, I know your perspective is that we are still in a structural bear market for bonds. So where do you see yields? Do you see yields going higher from here still? Um, look, as I said, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a tactical game right now. If, if we walk in in January and stocks sell off 20%, then no, right? Then no. But if we walk in in January and stocks melt up, then yes, absolutely. Um, I think we'll probably go back to five and nudge through five a little bit. I'm not sure we need to go a long way through five. Um, we did hit the top of a channel that we'd flagged to our clients. We, we got kind of lucky. We'd been playing this game where we're like, you know, something's got to give. And then bloody equities just picked up again during the early, the late summer. And we were like, this is no good. Bonds are going to have to just puke again, right? They're yeah. just going to have to puke again. And so we got short bonds on the 2nd of August. We sell, sent this thing out saying sell fixed income. And our, we said our target's 5%. Well, we got to 5%. So what was 5%? It was the top of a band around our, our demographics model. And our demographics model we used to kind of, and this is something I think that people, you and I talked a little bit beforehand. When put, people talk about demand and supply, in fixed income and, and the amount of debt that's out there. And that's most of the focus. It's the, the amount of gov that the governments need to spend, right? Particularly in a world of, of QT where central banks are picking up the, the, um, the slack and buying those, that debt from government. Um, you know, it has to be determined by the pool of global savings and where that price clears. And people rarely look at that side of the equation. They say, well, there's a lot of debt coming, so prices, the, the clearing rate for that debt has to rise. In other words, interest rates have to rise. They don't consider the other side of this equation. Because at the same time that we're trying to issue even more debt than we've done for a very long time, the pool of money that can buy that debt is has flatlined since really 2011. And worse for us in the West is it's become increasingly concentrated in the hands of the Chinese who post Ukraine, where we flexed our muscle, right? And said, Oh, dollarized, you know, and weaponized the dollar don't want to buy our debt and have actually been disgorging treasuries. So the pool of cash available for it, now you're going to get some, you know, if they go, if they're like, okay, well, we can buy. French debt, but we can't buy US debt. You'll get some fungibility. They'll come in, Michael, because they'll buy the French debt and then there'll be money left over that can buy some of our debt. But the point is, is that pool of available savings, which Bernanke wrote about in 2015, by the way, and said, Oh, there's just so much savings. Bond yields will keep falling. He did it virtually at the absolute peak of that savings pool has been flatlining since 2000. And 11, and then since 2012, uh, 16, our demographic models have moved up and they move up for the next 30 years, mate. <laughs> right. Now, doesn't mean you can't get big swings in bonds, right? I, you know, I think if you go into recession, treasury yields could fall to about 3% potentially, right? 10 year treasury yields. But when they get there, you sell them again 
because the next move is higher yields. We're in a higher global yield environment, not a, a lower one, until the pain gets so acute that at some point these central banks have to come in and do yield curve control or something because we will push governments from this to this point where their deficits become unstable, right? We saw that in the UK uh, with the LDI crisis, with this life insurance thing. And it wasn't really, that's how it manifests itself. It manifests itself with problems in the stability of life insurance companies because they've done, you know, some silly structures. What really caused it was Liz Trust, the prime minister's attempt to spend money unfunded, uh, sorry, by taxes or anything from the bond market. And the bond market went, no way, right? No way. Yeah. And that yeah. was the first time that the bond market basically called time on, a go on government spending. And talking to policy friends of mine in the UK, this is absolutely petrified, both the Tory government and the potential Labour government, you know, sitting in the wings, that they're all now worried that they don't have that fiscal flexibility. In the US, there is no sense of that fiscal constraint being put in place by the bond markets. They are still spending money willy-nilly. The debate, certainly if Biden and Trump are the ones running for election, will not happen. And so there's a real danger at some point that as we keep trying to push more and more debt into a pool of savings that is shrinking, that as those bond yields start to rise, at some point we slide into what is referred to, you hit what they call the fiscal limit. So you can't go any further without pushing up bond yields and curtailing the stability and starting to raise questions about the stability of that debt itself. Then the central bank has to come in and go, as a friend of mine says, Mike Taylor, he says, you know, the number one job of the Fed isn't employment and it isn't inflation. It's ultimately the stability of their boss, right? That they have to come in and they'll do yield curve control or something. It will just have very profound consequences. It isn't now. It's what all the gold guys really want. Like, cause at that point, gold goes, right? Not quite there yet, but we, I think are on that path, given that the pool of savings is just shrinking. Right. And also, you know, an increasing share of new treasury issuance goes towards, you know, paying back old treasury, uh, you know, pay, uh, paying back debt from the US. So there's kind of that cycle too. How far are we along on that cycle? Um, and I, I like that, the, you know, the real mandate of the Fed, right? Sort of keeping the, the boss, the treasury, the US government uh, sort of solvent and, and in a good place. And, and that gets referred, I think, right, as fiscal dominance. And actually, uh, Chair Powell's been asked in uh, not some of the most recent pressers, but a couple months ago, you know, he gets asked about what, what are your thoughts on the fiscal situation? And for a while, he would say, I do not comment on that. What you're describing is fiscal dominance. I'm not going to, you know, speak to that. More recently, I don't think it was in a presser, but he did actually comment on the fiscal situation and say this is not sustainable. So something changed, which indicates to me that he's concerned about it. But how far along are we on this path of fiscal dominance? And where, where are the rails? Because I agree, it's a bipartisan issue in the US, one of the few that we have, which is to spend money. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, how far? Well, I think we were getting dangerously close until Janet carefully game the system, right? I mean, you know, it's not going to be a linear process. Treasury does have tools that they can deploy. Um, are they sustainable? You know, not in the light of how much, unless we get a massive productivity boom that kind of bails us out, which might happen, you know, um, where we can run nominal GDP just incredibly high, right, for a long time and earn our way out. Uh, that would be what we hope for. You know, absent that, I think we're struggling, right? And you you brought up the Robin Hood dinners where you had, you know, true luminaries of the macro world, Drucker Miller and Ken Griffin, you know, both talking about the unsustainability of this debt. Um, and as I said, I think if it hadn't been Janet's timely response, things could have got pretty friggin' ugly um, at just over 5%. Right? And I think, you know, the U.S. is running the largest debt to GDP of any, pretty much every country in the world at the moment. This is fucking lunacy, 
right? We're in, we're in a booming economy, not a recession. I think it would be interesting, right? It's not my call. But what happens if we do get a recession? Now, what's supposed to happen is bond yields are supposed to fall, right? Right. But what happens if they don't because the bond market goes, you're running this debt now when your tax receipts fall because of a recession and you have to start paying out welfare checks to people and other support programs. You're going to spend even more money? I mean, that would be, that would be an eye-opener, right? That would be an eye-opener. And I, look, we're watching a bunch of stuff. None of it's horrible yet, but we're watching US CDS. US CDS has come off its highs, but it trades above the UK. Now, it doesn't go back a long time, 2008, but it never traded above the UK. It's the frigging reserve currency, right? It's not supposed to do that, but no, we blow out the deficit and it trades above the UK. And it's not miles away from Spain or Portugal or Greece now, right? You know, um, we watch uh, the Thomas Premium. I'm sure you've talked about it to this people. It's just kind of the premium you get for taking the risk of of, of investing down uh, the curve. Uh, it's come down off the highs that we hit when yields were at 5%, and we were very concerned about that. But is that going back into its hole again? I, I don't think so. I think that that has tendencies to, to move higher. The curve itself, when it steepens, where it bears steepens, so the long end sells off and yields rise as a result of that. That, I think, is something that we need to watch. Uh, very carefully. We need to watch dealer holdings of treasuries, right? Dealers, primary dealers, their job is to step up to the plate and they're holding, they're carrying quite large amounts of treasuries on their books, right? If that were to rise again, that's what in part led to the repo crisis that we got back in 2019, right? That would be an issue. Um, five-year, five-year break-evens would be an issue. If suddenly the markets went, uh, I don't think they're they're being serious about this. The five year, five year break even was so there's kind of various things that you can watch. They all looked a little, you know, on a traffic light system, I said they would probably amber, you know, when yields were five percent. Um, they've subsequently come back down and they're sort of greeny amber now. Maybe they go back to green and we're all fine, everything's great. I don't think so. Mm. I have a, um, I have a, maybe a, a reframing for some folks out there. Uh, and, and I'd love to get your opinion on this, Julian, because, you know, I, th I think sometimes when we, when we think about, I think many people would be agreed on the idea that the current system that we have when it comes to fiscal in the U.S. is, is not sustainable. And there's sort of one way of thinking, which is that the, the free market still reigns and, and that's going to teach the U.S. a lesson and force back some, some austerity or fiscal responsibility. There's another uh, Broadway <laughs> or, uh, family of solutions available to the United States, which is that they just change the rules, right? Um, and actually, that's what you see. So maybe some of these tools that are in the, you know, the Treasury or the various uh, alphabet soup of government entities, uh, like the BTFP sort of facility, right? So we come in, we engineer uh, sort of a mini bond crisis, regional banks respond, we roll out a BTFP, and we sort of uh, surgically save the banks that we, we would like to save. And I think Russell, um, Russell Napier does a really great job of this, of describing shifting to a system of credit provisioning, wherein actually the, the unsustainability of the current system causes breakages, but those breakages cause people to run back to the only place where there's safety and the government is kind of the one who steps in and gets to choose where to dole out credit and provide safety within markets. So... I guess the, the, the primary difference that I'm, that, that's what I, I would probably be in that camp as well, you know, because I think, I think I, there's. Yeah. And I, cause what you're talking about is basically the end of sort of less a fair economics, right? The sort of, we'll get, leave it to the invisible hand to apportion and allocate capital because it's so efficient. Well, I think that concept was found to be wanting in 08. And subsequently, we've gone through a series of iterations of governments coming in again and again and again to 
put a Band-Aid over a problem, bandage up something that sta- you staunch the bleeding, right? And I think, and this may, this undoubtedly, if this comes up during your conference, will cause some concern because I think it's 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 something that's inherently deeply viscerally believed in the crypto world. This idea that you know the system is is set up to enable it to evade the heavy hand of government, and you know this is my kind of get out of jail free card, and I can be still be a citizen of the world, and I can move my assets around and they'll never be able to stop me. And I, I'm with Russell. I, I think if you go back through history, what you're essentially asking is which of the two is more powerful? Is government, which sees itself as a manifestation of the will of the people, more po- po- powerful, or are free markets? And history would suggest that it's the former. Mm. And I think, you know, this is, I was at the Gold Conference in Zurich recently and I was asked this question and I said, I think some of you need to be quite careful when you sit there and you ruminate that gold is going to 4,000 or 5,000 and you need to sit there and say, under what circumstances does it go to 4,000 or 5,000? And am I prepared for that, really? Does just owning gold prepare me for that? And I think the answer is no. And I'm not saying that crypto, I've said this in time and time again, crypto could be an amazing trade if we move to that point of fiscal dominance, right? Where the Fed is forced to step in and start <clears throat> providing liquidity to the government, throwing, you know, throwing out its mandate, the dollars under pressure, all of those things. That's when shit gets real, right? That's when the man really proves that he's the man. And as an individual, you are nothing, right? You are nothing. You are subjugated to the greater will of society. And that's why, you know, throughout history, right, we've seen times of fiscal dominance and they're not necessarily wrong, Michael, right? When society faces a challenge such as Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan, it locks up the treasury market. It spends what it spends. It financially represses its people for the greater good. Mm-hmm. If we drive the system to the point that it's at breaking point and crypto's a hundred thousand, gold's five thousand, right? Don't expect a different response. So let me, so. I agree with a large part of that, but l- let me try to create a, a, a through line. And I'm not speaking sure, for absolutely. the crypto industry, but this is my perspective. I would reframe a little bit your the two forces that you laid out between governments and free markets uh, as actually governance, uh, governments and technology. Because I actually think free markets and government, they're thought of as being opposing. But I think there's actually a lot of good research that shows uh, actually, free markets work best when there's trust in government. So those are things I actually think walk sort of hand in hand. Yeah. But then there's this, there's uh, what is, well, what maybe is ultimate- free markets is wrong. I should say unconstrained markets. Put yeah. it that way. Unconstrained okay. markets. I think markets work best in constraints. I, I, yeah. I think these like free market maximalists, like, look, uh, from an ethos perspective, I would put myself in that group. If I'm like operating in the real world and I have my pragmatist hat on, I would say there's no such thing as free markets, right? right, right. So, uh, so those two things I actually seeing as being uh, sort of intertwined. But then there's this other aspect of technology, and what what's ultimately more important there when a new technology bumps up against a government, and that the standard response of the government is to say we don't like this technology, uh, that this is not good. And I actually think to your point, I think governments are initially more successful. I think they, they do a good job in the interim of squashing stuff. But I think over the long arc of history, they're pretty unsuccessful in that. And actually, new technology tends to, to win out. And this is where I, I would, and this is where I would, by the way, I agree with you. If, um, if one, if, if we go to this fiscal dominance and they start pumping, they, they have to come in and buy the whole system, as people like to say, and gold goes to, I think that's actually pretty negative for both gold and definitely Bitcoin in the short term, because I tend to agree with you. I ascribe a decently high chance that they would just 
ban it or confiscate it like right. they did with the executive order back in the 1930s. Yep. That yep. said, there is an entirely other part of um, crypto, which is actually how can we use this sort of digital letter, ledger substrate to build businesses that otherwise would not make sense in another context. And those businesses, again, over the long arc of, of time, I think that will be proven out to be, there'll, there'll be a lot of great businesses that are built there. So totally concur. I think, it, you know, I totally, totally concur. I think the the underlying technology is amazing. I think, you know, and this is, this is the, this is the conversation I had in Zurich. I said, you know, look, if, if the world is at 5,000, you know, if gold is at 5,000, bloody better be careful where you have your gold, right? Yeah. Bloody yeah. Be better be careful to have your gold because, you know, at that point, your gold may not be as valuable as, as lead and brass, um, you know, which is a bullet. Because, uh, you know, if we're, we're there, you know, things could get a little, a little hairy. And I think... Um, I think that's that's the problem with people. People become very evangelistic about this sort of stuff, and I think they have to be realistic. And I think when you, if you start to get to those very heady levels, Michael, you've got to be thinking about where is my gold, right? Physically, you know, where is my crypto? And I'm not saying they ban crypto per se. What they may do though is they may just ban. Uh, transfers outside the US economy, right? You can get exchange control. So that's an obvious thing to do. And, you know, to the extent to which people are um, able to circumvent the system, that's when the risk rises. Because gold, you probably can't, right? But you can with crypto. And that's the, it's almost too good. That's why I worry about crypto. It's almost too good at circumventing the system that they shut it down. And then people will say, then the evangelist goes, but they can't. And I'm like, really? Really? If they pick half a dozen people out and they do what they've done to the Binance guy and they just, you know, throw him in a, in a hole somewhere in Texas for 200 years and your wife goes, do you have any of that crypto shit? You do, don't you? You know, they've told you you've got to hand it over $5,000 a coin. And you're like, yeah, but it's worth, a hundred, and she goes, I don't want the father of my child to end up in jail for 220 years. Fucking hand it over. What are you going to do? I, I tend to agree with you. I, I, I completely agree with you on that. I think, I think the, maybe to, um, I think ultimately though, what that, when, when the government came in, right, and they or, ex, uh, it initiated executive order, what was it, 3102, or I forget the exact numbers. Something like that. It's it's seen as sort of a draconian measure, right? You're you're kind of drawing the government out into doing something that I think would be not very popularly supported, and ultimately that ban on gold. Admittedly, you didn't want to own gold over that period of time, right? Same thing for owners of crypto. Um, then you, but it ultimately was not successful, right? And uh, this this would be an example of that sort of winning. I, I, out. I, look, I, I totally I totally concur. I think the technology is great. Um, you know, they what they may do is go. We've got this lovely coin that you could have instead. It's called Fed coin. That's definitely happening. Right? That's hundred percent happening. So yeah. we're going to take your crypto. We're going to give you Fed coin. Oh, sorry. The next day we just devalued fifty percent. <laughs> I know. I know. It's and look. I actually. So I guess my my two perspectives on this are one from this sort of a historical perspective, and also as you know, relatively young person growing up in America. You know, I kind of get where the government's coming from. I, I sort of feel like the government is, it's such a big entity. They oversee so much. There are so many different moving parts that in some way, maybe all of this was just inevitable and you can look throughout the long arc of history and this is something that we constantly do, Dude, right? Sure. Um, where we get out over our skis, we create too much credit. There has to be some sort of deleveraging event. But also just by luck of where sort of I'm born and uh, the sort of, you know, younger generation, I'm also kind of looking at this and saying, hey, I understand that this needs to happen. I get why it happens, but I don't want to be on the losing end of this. <laughs> I don't want to be on the and losing I, end of this. Is, that's why we're talking now, right? People you don't know? want to be on the losing end of this. And right. I think it's great. You know, one of the reasons why, you know, I joined Raoul and did Macro Insiders at Real Vision is because we wanted to try and help people navigate through what we think is going to be a pretty tumultuous period. I fear. I hope I'm wrong, Michael. I'm just 
I would love to end my dotage sitting on my my deck with a with a glass with a gin and tonic, you know, and nothing have ever gone wrong again, right? And it just gently slip out of my hand, right? You know, I hope that for you too, Julian. I, yeah, I, I mean, you too. know, I I just worry, you know, that's not likely to happen. I think we've got more tumultuous periods coming. Um, and we're at one of those inflection points. You call it the fourth turning or whatever terminology you want to apply to it. It just seems inevitable. I tend to agree with you on that. I think change is coming. You can see it socially here in the US. You can see it all over the place, right? This is, you know, you've referred a couple of times to the Roman Empire, rise of populism. There's a that new Argentinian president that just got elected, Javier Maleni, or whatever it is. And, and and it's funny, you're starting to see, I'm seeing people on my timeline cheer for that. And I'm sort of wondering why, are you, you know, it's interesting that you're cheering for this because this guy's clearly populist. If you go back in time and look at, uh, you know, when populism ends up surging, you don't really want to live through that period of time. No. You know, that tends to presage no. not so great times. Yes. Uh, I call and, it the heads on stick phase. Yeah. Right? yeah. That's pretty much what happens. People's heads end up on sticks, right? Yeah. And, you know, I look, I, yeah, I, I get concerned. I'm, I, you know, I'm building a house and it's way, way away from everywhere. You know, I don't fault you for doing that. I feel like that's pretty good. You know, you mentioned the Rubicon earlier in this podcast. I'd, I'd recommend, uh, there's a book called Rubicon written by a guy named Tom Holland. It, it uh, surveys kind of the end of the Roman Republic and the transition to empire. And it discusses all, you know, he actually goes in, in ex exquisite detail about all of the actual characters and sort of the statesmen and all of that, the, all of the stories and how that, that transition ended up happening. And, yeah, you'll see a lot of parallels with the the current time is is all I will say. So, um, but you know, it's also even through all that uh, civil war and difficulty, the empire still had like two hundred more years. Um, you know, yeah, to look, peak it, to peak. Let's, uh, I, I, I look. I, you know, look I mean, honestly, if you said that's why I'm not like people go, well, you know, you're calling for the end of. Uh, look, I'm a dollar bear. I think it's structurally it's overvalued right here. But people say to me, you know, oh, you're uh, you're calling for the end of the dollar. What? What are we going to put our money in? Bloody Remimbi, the currency of a of a dictator, right? A tyrannical dictator? No, right? <clears throat> doesn't mean it doesn't lose value, and we don't. You know, we couldn't. Doesn't mean we don't go from 1971 to, you know, the thing fall in a straight line for the next decade, right? Yeah, I plenty of opportunities to make money. Plenty of opportunities to make money. They're just different from the ones that we've made money in over the last decade or so. Yeah, I think so too, Julian. Uh, always a treat when our paths cross here. This has been a, a ton of fun and you've been very generous with your time. If folks want to find out more about you, the good work that you do, find out more, like either follow you on Twitter, your research, which I highly recommend uh, folks check out. What's the best way to do all that stuff? So there's kind of three things, uh, well, two, two points of contact. The first one is, if you want to follow me on Twitter, at JulianMI2, on X, X, sorry, I'm just showing how old I am on X. Um, and um, the second thing is if uh, we have two products, we have our institutional product, uh, MI2 Partners, uh, and we have our joint venture with Raul, which is more, you know, through the Real Vision portal, which is a little bit more uh, retail orientated. And the easiest way to look at either of those is just to contact support at mi2partners.com. Awesome. Uh, guys, I highly recommend that you do uh, contact support at mi2partners.com. Check out the good work that Julian does. Um, Julian, my friend, as always, it's been a ton of fun and uh, I will see you soon. Enjoy your your holiday. Yeah. Good luck with the turkey, mate. <laughs> I need all the luck I can get. All right. Cheers. <laughs>